my name is Audrey Lim and I am beaming into your screen from Singapore. A little bit about me, my background is in performance art. So I was a musician performing in bars, hotels and at events. Remember when we had those before COVID? And I was also a music manager coming to conferences just like this one to hang out with everyone in person. But since that's not possible right now, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what I've been doing, one performer and producer's journey through COVID using technology. We've all known that COVID has made things a little bit more challenging all over the world. And so that's the first point, the context of a contactless world. Live performances, stadium shows, pub and hotel regulars, all of this evaporated before we even went into formal lockdown all over the world. Events and pubs in Singapore were asked to wind down and immediately all these performers who really, really wanted to just get out there and, and perform for everyone made a knee-jerk pivot to live streaming. Which brings us to point number two, the challenges of live streaming. Now, all these performance who came together and said, you know what, I'm not going to let something like venue shutting down stop me. I'm going to try to find a way to bring my craft to the people no matter what. However, all these performers lacked streaming gear. They lacked know-how. They lacked the inclination to spend and master new skill sets when their original livelihoods were already threatened. Because cast your mind back to February 2020, no one knew just how serious COVID-19 was going to be. No one knew just how long our brief lockdowns or whatever you call them in your part of the world, we didn't know how long it was going to last. And so that was the first barrier to entry for the challenge to live stream. The second big barrier to entry was oversaturation. What I mean by that is that big names like international superstars were putting up their live streams for free. Non-music content was also being put up for free. I'm sure we all remember how a lot of theatre studios, all of these big venues were putting up recordings of stage plays, of musicals, of operas. They were putting all of this up for free. And adding to this, Existing streaming sites were more available than ever. Existing video games were more available than ever. Audiences, therefore, had so many free options. And some of these audience members had also lost their jobs. And all these factors, when you put them all together, there was no urgency to pay these musicians who were putting up their live streams. There was no urgency to pay them for their work. There was also, in some territories, a lack of sympathy from policymakers for the performers who are out of work. I'm sure everyone might be familiar with a survey that was published in Singapore's Sunday Times that has since gone slightly viral, just a little bit. Performers and artists were polled and viewed as non-essential. Now, this went all the way as far as the UK and lots of commentary has since been, been brought up about just how essential artists are, just how essential performers are within the context of life and within the context of a pandemic. Now, the survey demonstrated that there was no understanding, there was no sympathy from the general public about the plight of the performers and their inability to earn a living and how they were essentially made structurally unemployed during this time. Instead, most performers were encouraged to pivot. Now, that's a word that was used a whole lot in Singapore. Everyone was encouraged to pivot with no genuine understanding of how much this pivoting was actually an entirely new skill set and came at an entirely new cost. Because think about it. If you are a performer, your knowledge is your instrument, your craft, your music. Live streaming would involve knowledge of lighting, audio town, uh, audio engineering, audio gear, setting up your studio, setting up the environment that you're trying to, to record in, knowing how to download and use gear, which will allow you to remotely interface through the internet with band members that used to just be on your left and your right. This was an entirely new production skill set, an entirely new engineering skill set, and it all came at a cost. Because if you were a drummer, you would have invested in your your instrument, your gear, maybe moon gels, drum pads, but you would not have invested in lights and microphones and all of these other engineering gears that you needed to successfully interface with your band in another house. 
add this to the additional problem, which we spoke about earlier, about how no one got paid. This was very, very serious because within the context of the performers that I've been interfacing with, these were all professional musicians. They weren't hobbyists. They weren't Sunday painters who were doing it for fun. But at best, live streaming allowed the performers who wanted to keep performing. Sometimes these performers got tips but these tips did not replace their earnings. Livestream, in fact, ignored the other aspects of the performing industry. I'm thinking about my audio engineers. I'm thinking about my artist managers. I'm thinking about my show promoters, artist managers, the, the sorry, the, the venue managers rather, the ticketing platforms, the concession stand operators, the rest of the ecosystem didn't have live streaming as a meaningful option. Because how on earth are you going to persuade someone to watch a live stream of an artist manager negotiating a contract? How are you going to persuade an audience to watch a live stream of a crew member laying cables. It's just not something that an ordinary audience member would be interested in doing. And so while one aspect of the ecosystem in entertainment was allowed to live stream, they didn't have success and it ignored everyone else. This brought me to my first version of the project that I've been keeping busy with. I've called it Take Back the Night. And it was a reference to how Lots of musicians who were playing pubs, hotels, and regular gigs, we call them playing nights. And we were told to stop. So we wanted to take back the nights. So in this first version, which I put together with a few of my friends in February or March last year, 2020, what I did was I pulled together industry friends before we even knew what Dorscon levels were. Do you remember those? There, were, there was green, orange, yellow, and red. We've put that out of our, our lexicon, our language in Singapore right now, but that was our first introduction to COVID-19 being actually a serious thing. With Take Back the Nights, the live stream edition, what we wanted to do was to create a broadcast level live stream. Now, we had no way of predicting back in February 2020 that everyone would be doing a live stream. Instead, what we wanted to do was to have a broadcast level live stream with official music singers, we wanted to have variety show style games, we wanted to have interviews with uh, industry members, and we wanted to make sure that the beneficiaries of this included not just the performers, but also the crew who was out of work. We wanted to make sure that this was as easy as possible for people to give money to us, so we tied up with a registered charity. Uh, in fact, there was a speaker from that charity last year, uh, SG Muso, which was uh, which recently got got certified as a charity, and we would handle the funds from the public through the charity, so no one would think that we were doing something that was not quite right with the funds. We even had a QR code so people, members of the public, could scan it on the screen and just make things generally easier for people to pay the performers. We programmed one very senior act, we programmed two relatively younger acts to try and cater to more audiences and we had these people perform in two languages. Just again to open it up to as many people as possible. Unfortunately, we were unable to secure a permit to help keep filming when we, sing when we in Singapore went into lockdown. We were unable to continue to help the ecosystem but we did manage to film a few episodes in three locations immediately before we went into lockdown. So we were extremely, extremely lucky. Unfortunately, this wasn't extremely sustainable because at that time, I was paying everyone out of pocket and I'm one person, so that wasn't a very long-term solution. And along with live stream fatigue, where we found out that we were fighting with so many people for a piece of the live stream pie, we realized that it wasn't sustainable. The live stream format wasn't something that was going to work for us. And so we decided that we needed to evaluate, reevaluate where we were coming from. And this brings us to the reason why I believe I was invited to speak with you today. The second version of Take Back the Nights, which we then reimagined as a virtual music festival experience. Taking a sip of water first. Now, I've spoken to you about the background, the context, and I think the context is kind of important to think about this, right? The first question, why? 
why would we even want to create a virtual music festival experience? Well, it came from one of the volunteers at the time who suggested that, wow, we are now one out of 100,000 live streams. We need to create something that's less easily replicable. And to do that, we should harness technology. Now, all of these words were very nice to hear, but how? How do we do this? During Singapore's lockdown, the primary and second-hand market for gaming chairs and gaming consoles whew, went through the roof. Everyone wanted to get, get their hands on this. Why? Because they were suddenly spending so much time at home. And everyone seemed to be very open to the idea of spending time in a virtual video game world. So we decided that we would build a music festival in a video game world using a video game engine. So that was the why question covered. The second question was who? Who would these people be? Our prime production collaborators that we spoke to and tried to get on board for this video game edition of Take Back the Night, we were working with some of my previous volunteers whose company had filmed the live stream. So they knew what we were about. They understood our values. They understood what we were trying to do. We also tried to hire as many people from the music ecosystem as possible. For instance, one of our directors of the music festival was also a music producer in a past life. Both of our audio engineers are also music performers. Our ad sales director was a music tour manager and co-founded a music label. Music programming was also a huge thing for me and what I wanted to do was engage the same three acts who performed in our live stream when I couldn't pay them very much. I was very eager to hire them as a priority this time around since I could pay them a little bit better. I also programmed different genres across each of the four episodes of the virtual music festival event so we could better track what sort of music audiences responded to and I made sure to include, along with my partners, original music artists, cover artists who played in bands, DJs, covered the spectrum, covered as many genres as possible, so we could help as much of the music ecosystem as possible. Of course, we were just one tiny program, so we couldn't do everything, but we really wanted to try and reach out to as many people singing and performing in as many languages as we possibly could. For panel speakers, my favorite part of attending a music festival is, besides the music obviously, is all the different fringe activities. And I always enjoy traveling to another country and listening to panels on various subjects that are important to my industry. I also programmed four different panel sessions on subjects ranging from the basics of VR and AR to what music labels are doing to help in a pandemic, as well as how to market in an entirely music, digital world rather. We also had visual art collaborators and through, this was really quite interesting. So it was through moderating rooms and speaking in other people's rooms on the social app Clubhouse that again, this was during the pandemic where you couldn't meet people the traditional way. I happened to meet someone on Clubhouse who also said that he was interested in working the virtual music space and he happened to be in Singapore. So we ended up meeting for a coffee, meeting for a beer, and we ended up collaborating with visual artists called Matamo Industries for the festival. And Matamo Industries, as our collaborator, also curated one of the four music festival events with their music friends. So this is how we ensured that we had as much outreach as possible to try and spread the joy around as much as we could. We also had F&B collaborators where we worked with F&B entities to allow them to have virtual booths where audiences at the festival could order in the virtual world and then our collaborators would have the F&B delivered to them in real life in their homes. So this was really fun. We worked with a bakery called The Whisking Well. We worked with some alcohol and, and, and sports drinks distributors. It was really quite uh, an unusual situation to say the least. And it was our way of ensuring as many elements of an actual festival came through as possible. The next question is how? How did all this happen? Now our very first challenge was funding. We were very incredibly fortunate to get a grant from Singapore's Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth under their uh, Re Revive Your Somerset Belt project. And it was really quite exciting because we were now being challenged to revive an area of Singapore's actual geography of Singapore's very famous Orchard Road that used to be 
really, really, really hot and had lots of very exciting youth programs, art programs across all the spectrum, all the performing and visual arts. But because of the pandemic, maybe people weren't going down to that space as much. And we were challenged to create touch points of the real world within our virtual world. So that was the funding issue that we more or less managed to, to check off, right? The second challenge was know-how. Within the few of us, we knew how to program a festival. We knew how to perform in a festival. We knew how to promote a festival. We even knew how to design for the video game engine that we were using. But we didn't quite know how to create this world and then put it up on the internet for everyone else. We initially reached out to some Singapore game designers and unfortunately we could not find a suitable collaborator and creative savings had to be had because we were just experimenting and trying to figure out how all these things could be done. So we used existing apps like Discord to bring voice chat features into the game versus adding that one more element into the game and making it even more challenging for ourselves. With all these questions answered and with the admission <laughs> that, we weren't, that we weren't professionals, we were trying this out for, for the first time, mistakes were made. Mistakes were definitely made. We decided to focus on world building, recording, rendering the performances without considering how challenging it would be to host the game on an appropriate server. We had reached out to a server provider who would take on what most server providers viewed as too small a project. And the server provider ended up not being able to provide us data in a timely fashion, which proved extremely frustrating. I'm sure you know that now that everything has gone online, data is more important than ever. And for basic things like how many people came through our door to take four or five months to get to us, that was extremely, extremely frustrating as new music virtual world creators. As non-game programmers, we didn't initially account for how difficult it would be to build in interactive tools like seeing other players in the same server, how to identify your friends on the same server, how long it took to upload a version of the game onto the server, all of these things, we had to make the mistakes firsthand. Now, even after we found a regional collaborator consultant who built video games for a living to come on board, we were still blindsided by very simple things. For instance, we didn't know that our server had blocked out specific buttons. I know I'm getting a bit technical here, but we had built mini games into the virtual world. And in order to exit that mini game, we had programmed the backspace key. So once you're done playing the game, you press backspace on your keyboard and you exit back out into the real world. Unfortunately, we didn't know that the server we used had disabled the backspace key. So what that meant was lots of people were now playing the mini games and they were trapped. They couldn't come out. So we had to try and fix that on the spot. We ended up changing the escape key from backspace to the E, the E for exit key. But these were issues that we could not have known because the server had not told us ahead of time that certain buttons weren't working. On the marketing side, the agency that was assigned to help us promote the festival had a change of staff and very, very unfortunately, they handed over all their projects except ours. So we were laboring under the impression that someone was helping us get the marketing underway. But no, it was really, really unfortunate. But we were sort of accidentally left over and we were left for months with no marketing assistance. What we ended up doing was reaching out to traditional media who didn't quite understand fully what we were doing instead of reaching out to digital magazines who would have been more sympathetic and more enthusiastic about what we do. And we only rectified this really late in the game. Our other mistakes were staffing. In terms of the terms of the grant that we received had us prioritizing youth participation in the project, which was great. Unfortunately, quality control turned out to be a slight headache, a consistent headache, and we had to deal with differences of opinions between the older members of the team and the younger members of the team who had mismatched expectations. And I think it would have been easier if we had hired more experienced staff straight from the get-go. Now, in the little time that I have left, I'm going to just do a summary, summation and just tell you how it went. So at the end of it all, 
we had a music festival experience with four episodes. We had teething issues after every episode that we managed to successfully fix. And we had really pleasant stories of connecting people in a pandemic really quickly. There was a girl who messaged us on Instagram and told us that she hasn't seen her cousin who was studying in the US for many, many years. And as cousins, one of the things they loved doing was to go out to music festivals and hang out and make memories. And she texted us on, on Instagram to tell us that it was great. Her cousin and her met inside the virtual world. They did a photo shoot inside using their avatars. They watched music acts. They went for the panels and they made memories, which cousins thought the cousins thought they would not be able to do amidst the pandemic. And that made us feel really, really good about ourselves. We managed to provide a unique experience for performers who could now, for the first time ever, watch themselves perform on stage. We think we provided a unique experience to festival goers who could have a lot more immersive and interactive activity in a, mu in a music context versus, for instance, watching a Zoom concert where you press play or watching a YouTube video where you just press play and that's it. Everything else is a beautiful music video, but you don't have the autonomy to go left or go right or let's go see what that is over there or let's take a photo over there. This gave them true immersiveness, true interactivity. And we managed to keep a small, modest section of the music ecosystem in Singapore afloat, maintaining interest in developing new inroads to the future of hybrid events. A quick word to the future. Hybrid events are likely to be a continued part of our shared future for the next five years or so. And even if flights resume, the majority of consumers in our part of the world may not be ready to risk gathering in huge groups. Virtual music festival experiences and white label stadium spaces like Take Back the Night may bridge the gap and provide a way to bring music to a wider audience with a more intimate, more immersive experience. The lack of penetration of virtual reality headsets in the region may mean that more virtual music festival experiences built in video game engines may be more accessible in terms of data consumption as well as quality of experience. And again, everyone, I, I thank you for hanging out with me and hearing what I've been getting up to during the pandemic. Again, this is one producer and one performer's experience. And I'm really glad that uh, my thanks to the Round Festival for having me here representing Singapore and my love to all of you during this really challenging time. Let's keep making music and keep on keeping on. My name's Audrey Lim. You can follow me on Instagram at Audrey's Audrey and I will see you around the festival. Bye.